A happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers here. If you are here, it's a happy Mother's Day to your mother. I want to read something to you uh, that I found. This is a, it's called an Ode to Mothers. Now, for those of you that are thinking a, a rhyming poem, you can go back to Dr. Seuss. Okay? This is, this is actually what's called a, a quotation poem. Being a mother isn't simply a matter of having children. To think that is as absurd as believing that having a piano makes one a musician. It is true that you may occasionally overhear a mother say, children must have their naps. It's mother who knows best. When what she really means by that is that she needs a rest. <laughs> and yet all of the home remedies, a good wife and mother is still the best. For a mother is the only person on earth who can divide her love among ten children, and each child still receives all her love. Why some people even say it takes a hundred men to make an encampment, but one woman to make a home. And still others affirm that an ounce of mother is worth a pound of clergy. And didn't Billy Sunday once say, mothers fill places so great that there isn't an angel in heaven who wouldn't be glad to give a bushel of diamonds to come down here and take her place. Most of all the beautiful things in life come by twos and threes, by dozens and hundreds. Plenty of roses, stars, sunsets, rainbows, brothers and sisters, aunts and cousins. But you've only one mother in the whole wide world. A woman of noble character who can find. She is worth far more than rubies. Charm is deceptive and beauty fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Her children arise and call her blessed. So a very happy Mother's Day to all of the moms here. Where's David? Plug his ears. Okay. We're going to give our mothers some applause for all that they are. Okay, uh, Josh, if you would go ahead and put the picture up. Um, last week, as we were talking about Leviticus chapter 16, I was asking some questions about uh, the tabernacle and the, and the temple and the way things were laid out. And, and I, I was informed afterwards that some of you guys didn't really understand what I was talking about, and pictures help. So I've got a picture. We showed this a couple of weeks ago. And I want to just really quickly highlight... Uh, a couple of things in the tabernacle. Now it is our hope, it's my hope, that I'll find what I did with the laser pointer. Right there. There it is. Um, that very soon we will be doing a class on the tabernacle. And we will actually have a, a scale model and uh, some teachers that actually know what they're talking about uh, teach the class. And that's no pressure at all, Dennis and Jean. <laughs> no pressure. But there's a couple of things that I want to point out just real quickly. Um, <coughs> wrong button. There it is. Okay, so the front gate, um, or the, the curtain, when you come in, you immediately face the brazen altar. This is where the sacrifices were made, the burnt offerings. Past that, you have the brazen labor, or the bronze sea where they would wash themselves, the priests would wash themselves. And then you come to the, the, the tent of meeting. And inside the tent of meeting, there are several components. On the left-hand side as you come in is the menorah with seven candles. Okay, Across from it, on the other side, is the table of showbread. And that will have one loaf of, of bread for each of the tribes of Israel. And then going past that, right before the veil, there are two veils, one in the front, one dividing the holy place from the most holy place, or sometimes you'll hear it called the Holy of Holies. And this veil separates the holy place from the most holy place. Inside the most holy place is the Ark of the Covenant. 
and the ark uh, was a box that was made, and inside it, it had a couple of things. Does anybody know what items were in, or some people actually say in front of, but uh, most, most scriptures uh, indicate that they were in the Ark of the Covenant. Does anybody remember what's in there? We have the, the stone tablets, both of the tablets that got carved. Aaron's rod that budded, and yeah, and a, an urn or a pitcher of manna. Okay, now the cover of the the Ark of the Covenant is called the Mercy Seat, and on top of the Ark are two angels with wings outstretched so that they overshadow the Mercy Seat, which is the central area of the, the cover. It was the Mercy Seat above which the presence of God would dwell. Okay. So in these different components, now we'll, we'll, if you want to know more about these, each of these are an incredible illustration of the Messiah to come, okay? And, and I would encourage you when uh, we offer the class, attend. Because we look at these things and I, I remember for a, a lengthy period of my, my walk in Christ, I looked at these things and went, okay, so what? Because I didn't have understanding, all right? So what we are dealing with today, working out of Leviticus uh, chapter 16, we see uh, a number of things. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 16. I'm going to catch us up and, and try and move us forward and, and get this covered for you. Now, we've talked already in... in Chapter 16, verse 1. They establish the timing of what's going on here. And if you look at verse 1, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. Okay, does anybody remember uh, the two sons, what their names were? <coughs> Bonus points, what's that? Abihu. And Nadab and Abihu, or Abihu, yeah. Um, these were the two older sons of, of uh, Aaron and they brought what, what the scripture refers to as strange fire and they presented it before God <coughs> now the, the word strange means alien or, or different uh, it's not the norm and they brought this, this fire before God to offer it uh, before the ark and they were struck down and, and it says fire came from heaven and destroyed them Okay, so we immediately, we know the timing of what's going on because verse 1 tells us it's right after the two sons died. Okay, and so moving forward, uh, God establishes in verse 2 some limitations. Okay, he tells Aaron, you can't come before me whenever you want. You can come before me in the most holy place now keep in mind, we have the holy place where stuff was going on on a daily basis. They had to keep the candles lit and trimmed. They had to replace the showbread once a week. Uh, they had to keep the incense going so that the priests would come in there. If you remember in uh, the book of Luke, it talks about Zechariah. He was serving in the temple. Now, the temple is set up exactly the same way, except it's not curtains. Okay, so you come in and you have the, the bronze altar, the, the uh, brazen labor or the, the bronze sea. Then you have uh, inside the temple itself, you have the exact same arrangement. Uh, by the way, which way does this face? Does anyone remember? East. east. It faces east, always east. Okay, so in the temple, uh, Zechariah was ministering inside the holy place when an angel appeared to him. Okay. The most holy place was off limits. As a matter of fact, it's kind of an interesting thing because when God made Aaron high priest and he established the rules, Aaron was allowed to go into the most holy place to the presence of God, but Moses was not. Okay? Ponder that for a minute. Okay? God allowed Moses to see the train of his glory, but Moses wasn't allowed to come into the most holy place. Only Aaron was. Okay? And, and then, so God establishes in verse 2, he says, uh, tell Aaron not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil. Now, remember this whole thing is the holy place 
but inside the veil is the most holy place. So he says, tell Aaron, don't come in at any time into the holy place behind the veil uh, before the mercy seat that is on the ark so that he may not die, for I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. So there we see God establishing some limitations, establishing some rules. Um, the term for uh, the mercy seat is caparet, which is to cover. It's the same term that we see used in Genesis um, chapter 6, when God speaks to Noah and he says, I want you to build an ark and I want you to cover it inside and out with pitch. Okay, it's that idea, the covering. Okay, you got to keep a hold of that idea if you're going to understand what this means and how this is going to be fulfilled and has in part been fulfilled in the New Testament. Okay, so um, the now I've heard this word pronounced several ways. Genie, the Shekinah, the Shekinah, 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 the glory of God resided in a cloud above the mercy seat. Okay, so once a year was the high priest allowed to come in. But he had to follow a procedure. So in verses 3 through 5, I'm just, I'm just recapping these. We, we went over this last week. There are three things that were required of the high priest when they entered the most holy place. The first one, he had to have an offering for himself and his family. This was a bullock. Okay, a, a, a male, a bull. And it had to be sacrificed. Okay, um, the second thing, uh, by the way, this, this offering was not just for, for the high priest. Interestingly enough, it's for him and his family. Okay, so he had to have an offering. Uh, along with the bull, he had to have a ram for a burnt offering. Okay, so that's, that's the first thing. Second thing, there were specific garments that were required. If you look down here... Um, Verse 4, it says, He shall put on the holy linen coat and shall have the linen undergarment on his body. This is a garment that was worn once a year. And actually, rabbinic tradition tells us that it was worn once. And then it was not worn again. Every year they would make a new one. This is different than the, the robes that the high priest would normally wear. Okay? Uh, this is, there's not, no mention of a turban. There's no mention of the, the ephod. There's no mention of the um and the thumim. Uh, the, so this is different. Okay, the, the robes, the attire that he wore on his regular daily service, that was set to the side, and he would take on the, the linen garments and the linen undercloth, white. White. Keep that in mind. That's significant. Because, see, everything that's given to us in the Old Testament has its answer or fulfillment or continuation in the New Testament. When Jesus went up on the Mount of Transfiguration, how did he appear? Wow. He went up and he, he became white. <coughs> the garments that he wore. Okay? So, he had to have the special clothing. Number three, um, he also needed to have an offering for the nation. Two male goats. Alright? Um, so, skipping down to the next passage... Uh, verses 6 through 10. We have the presentation and the sacrifices. Alright? Um, if you look in verse 6, it says, Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. Uh, this, this phrase right here, uh, a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself, um, the, the Hebrew is, it's, it's actually his possession. Okay? When he brought the bullock in, it was not something that he could just go out and say, hey, I need a bullock. It had to come from him because it was a personal, this is a personal transaction, a personal intercourse between him and God. This is for his atonement, his purification. If this is not done, and he comes before the presence of God without that blood, he will be struck dead. Okay? God didn't play around with this. In order for us to grasp the absolute holiness of God, the absolute purity of God, we've got to go back into the Old Testament to see what he required of the people that, to come into his presence. Okay? 
And we really, we don't have a, a good understanding in our culture because we've lived for so long under grace. We don't have a good understanding of the absolute amazing holiness of God that, that keeps him absolutely separate from everything else in creation. We, we kind of just go, oh, God accepts me, God loves me, God embraces me, and yes, he does. But we forget the absolute holiness of God that cannot stand even a blemish of sin. Okay? So... He uh, has to, the bull has to come from his own possession, uh, whether he has a herd and he draws from the herd, or he has to go and purchase one. It has to be his. Okay? Um, the two male goats, uh, if you look in verse um, 7, it says, Then he shall take the two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Okay? Right here. This is the entrance. That's the veil. He's got to take the goats and put them before the veil. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for Azazel. All right. Um, now, there are four possible definitions of Azazel. All right. And, and depending on which rabbi you follow or which teacher you follow, it can change in, in some degree what this goat represents, okay? So I'll give you the four meanings here. The first one is it's possibly the escape goat or the goat of departure, okay? This is a literal translation of the word for the goat. It, it's, it's the goat that escapes. We actually use the term scapegoat, okay? Uh, we'll, we'll actually talk about that in a moment. The second one, uh, as a proper name, it could mean the powers of evil or the desert demon. Now the teaching that goes along with this is, is the thought is as the first goat is sacrificed to the Lord for sin, the second goat bears that sin and takes it out from the camp and away from the people. The, the teaching for this particular interpretation of the name is that the goat is returning the sin of the people to the devil who caused the people to sin in the first place. Okay, so... So the, the second one is the desert demon, and, and it's the idea that the, the sin of the, the nation of Israel is laid on this goat, and he takes it out to the desert to take it back where it belongs. The yeah. third meaning uh, is, um, de again, depending on how it's pronounced and the manner in which it's used, it could mean a rocky precipice. Okay? And this, this again, going into the rabbinic traditions... We know that this didn't happen while the people of Israel were traveling, but in the temple period, especially in the second temple period, we know from the writings that when the goat was released, it was given into the care of a man whose job it was to take it out away from the people. Uh, we know in the second temple period that goat would be taken up to a high cliff and pushed off. Okay, That the goat would die because they didn't want the goat to wander back into the camp. Okay, now, that's not something that is mandated in Mosaic law. Uh, it is not a Mosaic uh, requirement. Uh, all that's required according to what we've read here is, is that the, the goat is just released out into the wilderness. Okay, the idea being that the sin is born away from the people. And then the fourth uh, possible definition, um, in the abstract sense, this, this could also mean complete destruction or entire removal. Okay, and then again, when you think about the atonement, you think about God taking away our sins. Scripture says that he casts them as far as the east is from the west and that they're thrown into the sea. That, that's the same idea here, that all of the sin is being done with. Mm -hmm. All right? So, going forward a little bit in this, in this passage, um, I spoke to you last week just briefly um, about the, the thread or the cord. Um, there, there are two different teachings on this that I've seen. Uh, both of them say that the high priest would take, uh, after they were chosen by lot, um, they would take a, a two stones and they would shake them in a jar. One stone represented the Lord and the other was Azazel. And they would shake it over to this goat and whatever came out, that was either the Lord or Azazel. And then the other one, obviously, was the, the, the opposite. Um, when the goat was chosen, though, would, would, the one that would become the scapegoat, 
they would tie a red thread or a red cord around the horn of the animal. Now some traditions say they also took the, a piece of that cord and they put it on the temple wall. You go, okay, that's kind of weird. Well, it, it is weird until you see what God did with it because uh, history records, the rabbinic writings record that uh, up until about 40 years before the end or the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, approximately 40 years before that, every time they would release the goat and it would go out when that goat died, the cord would turn white, okay? And, and depending on the, the tradition, the, the cord on the horn or the cord on the temple would turn white. Now, interestingly enough, the rabbis write that at about 30 AD, the cord ceased to turn white. It stayed red. Okay? So, something for you to think about. This is not a biblical thing. If you not look through scripture, you're not going to find it. Uh, they did this based on the, the passage that says, Though my sins are scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Alright? So, something to keep in mind. Because about 30 AD, the rabbis understood something significant took place, but they're still in ignorance as to what it was. So, moving forward... Uh, verses uh, 11 through 14. This is the section that deals with the atonement for the high priest. We're going to go ahead and read through this. We've kind of covered all this stuff prior to this before. We're going to dig into this today. Verse 11. Aaron shall present the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall kill the bull as a sin offering for himself. And he shall take a censer full of coals from the fire before the altar before the Lord, and two handfuls of sweet incense beaten small, and he shall bring them inside the veil, and put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is over the testimony, so that he does not die. And then he shall take some of the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it with his finger on the front of the mercy seat, on the east side, and in front of the mercy seat, uh, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Now, we're, we're going to break this down a little bit, okay? The first thing that we need to pick up here is that before the high priest can make atonement for the people of Israel, his own sins has to be atoned for, okay? Because he's going to come and he's going to present an offering to God on behalf of the nation of Israel, but his stuff has to be taken care of first. Now, something to keep in mind, when we talk about the Feast of Atonement, the Day of Atonement, um, this was for the, the, the sin of Israel as a nation, okay, a, a general covering. This is very much like salvation in the New Testament. Even though everything has been done and salvation is offered, what's the only way that, that you're saved? Yeah, you have to have faith. You have to accept by faith that what he said he did, he did. And, and then you will be saved, okay? The same way, the Day of Atonement, if you were still living in sin, if you had not made yourself right before God, uh, we talked about the month of Elul, the month prior to Tishri, where they took that month and they prepared themselves, and then the 10 days from the Feast of Trumpets to Yom Kippur, the, the Day of Atonement, they were the, it was called the 10 Days of Repentance, where you were supposed to get your life right with God, that you were to uh, make the sacrifices for the sin in your life. Okay, if you had not done these things, then what the high priest did this day was of no benefit to you because you were still caught in your sins. Okay? So, um, <clears throat> so Aaron has to make atonement for himself <clears throat> and his family. Um, notice there are three different things that are going on here. After he kills the bull, um, he is to take a censer full of coals of fire from the altar before the Lord. Now some of the writers that I read say this was from the brazen altar out here. Some said no, it, the way it reads actually indicates it was the altar of incense. Um, I don't know. It would make more sense to me to be the altar, the brazen altar where the sacrifice for sins were made and the offerings were made, but what I read of this I don't... I, I don't have the Jewish teaching to understand, okay? And, and even the Jews argue as to which it meant, okay? So um, he would take some coals and he'd put them in a censer. Then he was to take some incense uh, 
and he was to take it inside the bale um, and put the incense on the fire before the Lord. Now there's two thoughts here. Okay, the first thought, which is the one that I believe is true, is that they're talking about this veil, not this veil. He was supposed to bring the incense in and present it here because inside here there's no fire. The altar of incense has fire, but inside the most holy place there's, there's no fire. Okay? Now, depending on how you parse the Hebrew, it could mean that the, the, the fire is in the censer with the coals. And that, that's the fire that you bring in because then it says that uh, it will make a covering over the, the mercy seat. And so, um, uh, he shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord and the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is over the testimony so that he does not die. Okay? Um, does anybody remember what Revelation talks about with incense? What does incense represent? The prayers of the saints. The prayers of the saints. Okay? Um, I think that's what's going on here is that, that when uh, Aaron comes in with this incense and the smoke is going up, it's not just covering the mercy seat, but it's also it's representative of the prayers of the people that have gone up asking for forgiveness. Okay? That's, that's my personal thought. Um, the third thing that he had to do uh, with the cloud would cover uh, the Shekinah or Shekinah glory of God. So when he enters the holy place, he's had to make preparation to go in. He's done the, the sacrifice. He's gotten the incense. The smoke is going up. And then he comes in and the altar, the Ark of the Covenant is set in front of him. And the scripture says, um, and he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the front of the mercy seat on the east side. Now, we know that the, the tabernacle and the temple always face east, so this is east, and so he's going to sprinkle blood on this side of the ark, okay? Now, I'm not sure why, but rabbinic tradition teaches that when he sprinkled the blood on the ark, he did it in an upward motion, okay? And then when he sprinkled, because immediately after that, he had to sprinkle up seven drops on the ground in front of the ark. And rabbinic tradition teaches that on the ark was up and on the ground in front of the ark was down. I don't know why that's important, but God doesn't do anything randomly. Even some of the things that they held as tradition that we don't have as scripture, God uses. Okay? So he makes this offering. He sprinkles the blood. Now his atonement is done. That's blood just for him and his family. The people at this point have still, there's been no atonement made for them. Okay? There's been no covering of sin for them. So we get down here to verse 15, and it says, uh, Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people, and bring its blood inside the veil, and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, sprinkling it over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. Then he shall make atonement for the holy place, because of the uncleanness of the people of Israel, and because of their tr transgressions, all their sins. And he shall do for the tent of the meeting, which dwells with them in the midst of their uncleanness. <clears throat> um, no one may enter, uh, no one may be in the tent of the meeting from the time he enters to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out and has made atonement for himself and for his house and for all the assembly of Israel. Then he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it and shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle uh, some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar all around. And he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the people. Now this, there's a lot going on in this passage here. Okay, so we're going to break it down piece by piece because they just put a huge chunk of the Day of Atonement in, in this like seven verses. So the first thing that we see, um, the high priest uh, has chosen the goats, have been, been chosen by lot. One of them is the goat for the Lord. And this is the one that is going to be the sacrifice for sin. Okay? He is to take that goat, he is to kill it, and he is to take the blood from that goat, and he is to take it inside the veil, 
and sprinkle it just like he did with the blood of the bull for him and his family. But this now is for the entire nation. He sprinkles once on the, the ark on the east side, seven times on the ground. But now he does something different. He comes out of the veil, and then he does the same thing to the tent of meeting. Why? Because the tent of the meeting dwells in the midst of the people who are unclean. So he is sanctifying for the year the, the most holy place, the holy place, and then he comes out of the tent and he, he sprinkles one other thing, what? the altar. He's consecrating the altar again. Now, if you've ever read anything about the setting up of the tabernacle, you know that after Moses gave instruction for everything to be made, before they could use it in service to God, they had to go through a process where the things were sanctified and they were made holy. And that was with blood and with oil and with water. Okay? All three had to be applied for the thing to be considered holy. Everything from the spoon, to the knife, to the altar. So as he's coming back out, he anoints the most holy place, he anoints the holy place, now he anoints the altar, okay? What did the altar do wrong? Absolutely nothing. Altars don't do anything. They leave them to themselves and they just sit there, okay? Kind of like one of us guys in our chair on a Saturday afternoon when football's on. You don't do anything to us, we're just going to sit there. And we're happy that way. Okay? It didn't do anything wrong, but it dwells in the midst of an unclean people. Okay? So we see that not only is Aaron making a sacrifice for himself and his family, he is making a sacrifice for the people of Israel, but he's also sanctifying, he's also uh, making righteous, making holy all of the different steps where the people would come to meet God. Um, okay, um, I'm going to jump down to verse 22. I'm sorry, verse 20. We're going to pick up right there. Um, so he's made the atonement. The bull has been slain. The goat has been slain. But now we have to deal with the scapegoat. The goat that's left. The goat with the, the cord. So picking up in verse 20, it says, And when he has made an end of atonement, or end of atoning for the holy place in the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall present the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions, all their sins. And he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all of their iniquities on itself to a remote area and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness. Now we just talked about this uh, as far as dismissing the goat. Mosaic law just tells us it's got to go in the wilderness. It's got to go, that, that word there is cut off place. Okay, it's got to go somewhere where people aren't, and people aren't going to be passing through there. There's no roads going to it. There, there's nothing that people are going to use. They are going to have to work to get to where this goat is. There's a man who is set aside. His job is to take the goat and make sure it gets to that place. Uh, we also mentioned that in later years, he would take it to a cliff and poop. Ah. Okay? Because they didn't want the sin coming back in among them. But that's not what the Mosaic Law says. The Mosaic Law says just, just put them out in the wilderness. Um, now there's, there's four things that happen here that Aaron does. The first thing he does is he places his hands on the, go the goat. Okay? He's, he is making that goat by touch the representative of all of the people of Israel. Okay? The second thing that he does is he confesses the sins, the iniquities, and the transgressions of all of the people of Israel. Now, you would think this is going to take a long time because there's a lot of people and there's a lot of sin. But I don't think he's going through, okay, you know, uh, Father, we, we make confession for uh, Avram because he really screwed up big this time and, and for Judah 
we, oh, he blew it really big here, and he, he didn't go person by person. He's covering the sins that are listed in the Mosaic <coughs> Law, and he's doing a blanket covering for everyone. Okay? Uh, so when he covers the, the sin of, of adultery, that covers all of the sin of adultery, if that person has repented. If that person has repented, guess what? This doesn't apply. <coughs> They're not made righteous. Okay? So he... <clears throat> Excuse me. He confesses their sin. He's, he's put his hands on. He's confessed their sins. He substitutes the goat for the people, making the goat bear their sins. And then finally, he releases the goat into the care of the man who will take it outside the city, outside the camp. So let's jump down to verse 23. And we're going to pick up there. Then, uh, then Aaron shall come into the tent of meeting and shall take off the linen garments that he put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there. And he shall bathe his body in water in a holy place and put on his garments and come out and offer his burnt offerings and the burnt offerings of the people and make atonement for himself and for the people. And the fat of the sin offering he shall burn on the altar. And he who lets the goat go to Azazel, actually I'm going to stop right there, okay? Because this, this is wrapping up the priest's, the priest's duties for the day. When, when he has let the goat go, before he can offer the burnt offerings, he has to go change his clothes, okay? Those garments that, that he put on at the very start of this thing, he went and he bathed himself. The Hebrew word for bathe means immersed. He, would, he completely immersed himself. Um, then he donned the white linen. When, when the sacrifice has been made and the goat sent out, he has to go change back into his other clothes. Okay, now this is probably his daily vestments. It's probably the, the high priest clothes that he wears every day. Because you see, immediately after he washes himself and puts his clothes back on, what does he do? He comes back out and makes another offering. Okay? He makes the burnt offering. And, and this is the, the ram that he brought for him and his family and the ram that was brought for the people. And he puts the, the parts of that animal that God has required, uh, the, the, the fat, the kidney. Um, I'm missing something. Do you, you remember what the other thing is, Dennis? The large of the liver or something. The liver, yeah. And they burn those things on the altar. But before he can do this, he has to cleanse himself again. Okay? It's almost like the Day of Atonement is taking place in two phases. The atonement part of this is the blood of the goat and the bullock in the most holy place. And then coming back out, now he comes back into the regular workings of things and makes a burnt offering. Okay? Um, as, as he does this burnt offering, he's changed his clothes. Uh, he's bathed himself and then he's changed his clothes. Then he makes his burnt offering. Okay, uh, and the fat of the sin offering he shall burn on the altar. And then in verse 26, uh, we, we, we jump over. Remember the, the, the dude, the, the, the goat dude? There's probably a Hebrew word for it. I don't know what it is. But a man selected to take the goat out to the wilderness. Once he has done his job and he knows that the goat is gone, what does he have to do? He, he's not done. Scripture tells us that... Um, he shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water and afterward he may come into the camp. He's got to wash up too. Now think about that. He's escorting sin out and in order to come back in he has to do the ritual washing. But not just him, his clothes. Everything has to be clean before he can come back into the camp. We talk about, Paul talks about sin being like leaven. He says that a little, little leaven works its way through the whole lump. Okay? And, and God is so serious about this that you don't even actually have to commit the sin, but if you come into contact with someone with the sin, then, then you have to cleanse yourself in, in this case. Uh, and the same idea of, of somebody that, that has leprosy, if you come into contact with them, you have to bathe before you can come back into the fellowship. If, if you... Uh, are in the presence or, or having to deal with uh, a deceased person, again, you have to wash yourself but so that you're clean before you can come back in. So that's what's going on here. This man is selected. I, I don't know if this would be something that you'd go, yes! 
they chose me. Or something that you go, oh, man. I, I don't know how they would feel about that. Um, but moving forward, um, verse 27, and the bull for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall be carried outside the camp. Their skin and their flesh and their, and their dung shall be burned up with fire. And he who burns them up shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and afterward he may come into the camp. Now this is an interesting point there. When you look in the first seven, seven or eight chapters in Leviticus, they're talking about the offerings and all of the different offerings that are going on. Okay, When an offering is made, the high priest and or the priest that is doing the offering on behalf of the person, they get to keep a portion for themselves. Okay, That's their lot. But in this case, the sin offering, nobody gets to keep any of it. The blood is used. What is not used, any of the stuff that is not offered or, or, or sprinkled, is to be taken outside the camp. Again, one person is selected. They are to take all of the, the skin, the bones, the stuff that was, the dung. Um, they take all that up, they wrap it up, they take it outside the camp, and they burn it. Because what is given to God for this case is not to be used by, uh, by people, even the high priest. Okay? And then this guy, now, see, I'm in question about the second guy, whether I'd be, yeah, I got it, or darn. But this guy, I'd be like, dang it. I got to haul poop. <laughs> He's got to take the awful out of the camp and burn it. It's got to be away from, from people and he's got to get rid of it. So it's burned. All right. So interesting side note there. Um, he has to wash both his clothes and his body and then he can come in to the camp. Now jumping over to verse 29. Believe it or not, we're going to get this thing done today. This, this chapter. Uh, verse 29. And it shall be a statute to you forever that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict yourselves and shall do no work, either the native or stranger who sojourns among you. For on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you. You shall be clean before the Lord from all your sins. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest to you, and you shall afflict yourselves. It is a statute forever. And the priest who is anointed and consecrated as priest in his father's place shall make atonement wearing the holy linen garment. He shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary. He shall make atonement for the tent of meeting and for the altar. And he shall make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. So there's a couple things that we need to note right off the bat. First, this is a statute forever. Now here's a tricky thing. Okay, what does forever mean? What? Always. Never ending. Forever and ever. That's the English word. The Hebrew word here, when they say forever, that's not a, an eternity. It's until the end of a, an appointed time. Okay? We look at that and we go, well, why are we not seeing this done today? Sadly enough, uh, because there is no temple and there is no way to make atonement, the Jews today, the rabbis teach that in order to be atoned, you have to repent and then you're good. But that's not what scripture says. Because scripture says that there is no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. Okay? Some of the, the diehard conservatives, they will actually sacrifice a chicken on that day so that there will be shedding of blood. You know, in for a dollar, in for a dime, in for a dollar. Um, but a lot of them say, hey man, you, you know, day of atonement, you just got to ask God to forgive you. If they really understood what was going on, they're right on it and completely far away from it. Okay? So um, this is a statute that lasts until the end of an appointed time, which we know to be the coming of Christ, uh, the sacrifice of Christ. Um, <clears throat> it is to be on the tenth day of the seventh month. That's the tenth of Tishri. Uh, it is a day that the Israelites must afflict themselves. In chapter 23, 
We see that when God is speaking to Moses about this, he says that the people must afflict themselves twice. Here he says it twice again. Now, the Jews took that to mean uh, that they should fast. There were actually a series of things that they would do. They were they're actually, at one point, they would actually scourge themselves 40 times with the, you know, the whipping of themselves 40 times to, to afflict themselves. Uh, they, they afflicted themselves with the fasting. You were not allowed to eat from sundown the day before to sundown of, of that day. Um, you, you fasted. This is based, um, oh, let me find it. There's, there's a passage, um, Isaiah 58, uh, verses 3 through 5. It says, Why have we fasted and you see not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the, uh, such the fast that I chose, a day for a person to humble himself? Is it, a, uh, is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast? and a day acceptable to the Lord. They take this passage and say, okay, well, the affliction has to be fasting. Okay? But if we read in the passage, we know that it's, it's not a physical affliction because what does it say? Let's go back here and, and, and look at this. Um, you say, it says, you shall afflict yourselves and you shall do no work. Uh, for on this day... Um, Verse 31, it is a Sabbath of solemn rest to you, and you shall afflict yourselves. It is a statute forever. Now, the, the Hebrew word, the, the Hebrew phrasing here is not afflict your body, it's afflict your soul. Yeah. It, it's not, okay, you can beat your body all you want, but if this is wrong, if this is goofed up, all you've done is bruise yourself. Okay? It's an affliction of the soul, and I think what that means is to come face to face with the stark reality that your sin has separated you uh, by an eternity from the, the Holy God. And, and it's a day of personal introspection and looking at where you're at in this life and, the, and where you're at in your relationship with God and, and re-evaluating the priorities of your life. I think it's something that is much more personal and inward than outward. Okay? Um, so they, they must afflict themselves uh, the Jews say that that has to be um, through fasting. Uh, they also said that they were to do no work. Neither was anyone who was sojourning among them. So if there were Gentiles that came and lived in the land, they were not allowed to work on this day. Okay? And, and you know why God did this. Because the Jews would be like, well, I've still got stuff to bring in. I've still got ground to plow. I've still got stuff that needs to be done. I know. I'll have him work it. He's not a believer. He's going to hell anyway. We'll let him work it. God says, no, no, no. No one in the land, whether they be native or a sojourner, no one is to work this day. This is the only time in Scripture that I can find outside of the seventh day of rest that a particular day is called a Sabbath. <clears throat> this is a day where no work is to be done. Okay? So... Um, so it's a Sabbath rest. You are to afflict yourself. Um, no one is to work. Uh, and, but then we see this weird little thing that happens down here that, you know, if you're not paying attention, you'll just blink right over. Um, in verse 32, God kind of changes this up a little bit. And he establishes that the high priesthood is going to be hereditary. You see what he says there? It says, and the priest who is anointed and consecrated as priest in his father's place shall make atonement wearing the holy linen garments. He shall make atonement for, now we, we get into this first, we've established that when, when Aaron dies, it, it's going to pass, the high priesthood is going to pass to his son. Okay, and, and he's going to be anointed by his father for that role. Okay, and then when he gets to that point, he, you guys heard that, right? <laughs> okay. Okay. You see, that happens to me all the time at home. I'll say, Christy, what is that? She says, What? Didn't you hear that? No. Well, never mind. Okay. So he passes it down to his son. His son will pass it down to his son. But then look, we go back and God reiterates what the atonement is for. 
He, he named, lists a number of things. He shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary, the most holy place. And he shall make atonement for the tent of meeting and for the altar. These are the three places where the blood was sprinkled. And they're making atonement again for it to make it holy for the coming year. But then he goes through and he lists the people. And he shall make atonement for the priests of which he is one. All of the priests. And this actually by extension is their families. And for all the people of the assembly. Now who are the people of the assembly? All the Jews. The Jews. Those that were given the promise. Those that were given the law. This is, this is for them. If they're following the law and they're keeping up with this thing, this is the, the, the national atonement for the nation of Israel. All right? And this shall be a statute for you forever. Again, till the end of the appointed time, that atonement may be made for the people of Israel once in the year because of all their sins. Okay, so we've, we've come full circle. Aaron, you can't come in anytime you want. The only time you can come in is on the Day of Atonement when you come first to make atonement for yourself, second to make atonement for the people. Okay? And then he brings it all the way around, and, and at the very end of this it says, And Aaron did as the Lord commanded Moses. Okay? Now, now wrap your brain around this. God is speaking to Moses and giving him all of these instructions, which he then turns around and gives to Aaron so that Aaron might fill them. God didn't choose Moses to be the high priest. He chose Aaron. And then through the line of Aaron, uh, we have a priest ourselves. Okay? Now, we, we, we no, excuse me, not the biological, not the, the physiological line, but through the Aaronic priesthood, and actually the priesthood actually goes back to Melchizedek. Okay? Jesus really actually doesn't really fit in any of those lines because, you know, he's God. He created all of them by his word. Okay? So we've come full circle. The Day of Atonement, Today, this is considered the high day, the high holy day of the year for the people of Israel. Um, if you remember uh, the Yom Kippur War, the Arab nations knew that this was the day that the people were to do no regular work. They knew that this was a command, that it was a national holiday. And what did they do? They attacked. And God defended his people, just like he did in the Hebrew Bible. Okay? So... Um, now we've gone through the nitty-gritty of the Day of Atonement. Next week, we're going to kind of wrap this, this feast up. We're going to start looking toward what this means to us, uh, how this is yet to be fulfilled, and how it has been fulfilled. And, and then we're going to move on. Amen?